approach? So when I decided to run for office, I wanted to not just be someone that was complaining about a system that I saw um, not working for too many people. I wanted to try to propose a solution. And whether it was the right solution or not, we would ultimately find out. But I refused to just be somebody who complained. And what I chose to do, Patrick, was meet with every single group that comes into contact with the criminal legal system. Police officers, judges, criminal defense lawyers, probation, <laughs> clerks, um, the community, right? People who are defendants, people who are currently serving time behind the wall. You name it, I sat down and asked their opinion. And to the person, nearly all of them, when I asked, look, if you had a magic wand and could change the system to be better, what would you do? Almost to the person, they said, we are criminalizing behavior that is, um, shouldn't be criminalized. So for example, mental health issues, substance use disorders, food and ho housing insecurity and homelessness. Yes, some of the effects of those things are deeply troubling and we see those every day, for example, in places like Mass Ave and Melnia Cass, but ultimately those individuals, they're in crisis, they're in harm and it's, and it's a, a public health crisis where we need other people aside from law enforcement at the table making decisions. So that's a long way of saying I came up with 15 uh, types of crimes that all are nonviolent or non-serious in my opinion. And I said, look, let's flip the presumption from arrest and incarceration or prosecution to declination, diversion and dismissal. And it is a rebuttable presumption. So we can always go back to putting them in jail, right? Which we are very good at doing, but let's turn it over on its head and see if we can get partners, community partners, um, you know, public health partners to assist us in this process. And then about two weeks after taking office, I said yes to some PhDs who said, we want access to all of your data because the most important thing is when we try something, we have to measure it and then be able to adapt if it's working or not. And so that, that study was released, the NBER study, and uh, it looks like it, it supports your approach. How, how does that feel to have that kind of recognized by the academics? So yes, it was um, very nice <laughs> to have the research uh, and data support what we were proposing and ultimately what um, there were three PhDs from, you know, NYU, Rutgers University and Texas A&M that all conducted the research, which was published in the National Bureau of Economic Research. And basically looking back over about 17 years back to 2004, over 67,000 cases they looked at all of my list of 15, which of course didn't exist back then, but they had the, the type of crimes and said, look, when we dismiss this after a person comes into contact with the criminal legal system the first time, do they recidivate at a higher rate, for example? Do they come back into contact with the system doing the same or even worse something else? And you know, I am happy to say that when we decline or dismiss, they did not recidivate within those two to three years. When we actually arraigned them and moved them forward in the system, unfortunately, they recidivated at a much higher rate. Um, so that in normal words, right, for, for people, those of us that like don't, you know, put data nerd hats on all the time, which is okay. Um, what it means is, according to the data, when we turn people away and get them the help and services and treatment they need that is not carceral, they often don't come back into contact with the system. But unfortunately, when we bring this into the, them into the system, they touch the system again at that level or an even higher one. The most important part of that though, Patrick, there's a few really interesting things. People love mischaracterizing my list of 15 as like, I never will prosecute them. That's not true. It is a presumption that is rebuttable. So if it's Patrick, 
uh, Donahue that comes into contact with the system for one of these 15 areas of crimes, and you've never done anything like this before in your life, or let's even say in the last three years, or there's a, you know, you're in a mental health crisis or something happened, it'll likely be declined, dismissed, or diverted pre-arraignment. If it's Rachel Rollins, and this is the third time I've done this in the last year, um, in Suffolk County, and I've done it three other times in Middlesex County and once in Norfolk. All of those tactics haven't worked with Rachel Rollins. So we are going to move forward with an arraignment and we are going to work hand in hand with the court, the judge in probation, to find an appropriate solution for Rachel, which might result in a carceral sentence or might result in some other program that the court and probation now have with the DA the ability to uh, mandate that you do. So what was interesting about the data is it showed in 56% of the cases, Rachel Rollins declines or dismisses or divert, diverts. But Dan Conley before me did it in 42% of the cases. So a lot of people think it went from zero to 57 under Rollins. It didn't. My predecessor was doing this. He didn't trust you with that information though. I don't want to sneak this by you. I want you to be aware of what we're doing. So that's number one. Number two, if I'm doing it in 57% of the times, that means that in 43% of the times, we're not doing it, if my math is correct, right? So that proves or disproves what the critics often say is she's refusing to prosecute. Well, no, no. In 43% of the times, we do move forward with those type of cases and we go to arraignment. Now, whether it's dismissed after that is a different story, but the brand of a criminal record happens after you stand at your arraignment. Right. And so there are a couple of things I'm wondering there. One is the you mentioned your predecessor and I, and I had read that, you know, that he was doing this, but had not really codified it. And it was more of a random uh, approach, although it sounds like it wasn't too far off from from the, the number of times you're doing it. Right. What was the effect of, of that more randomized and also just not public approach uh, of your predecessor? Well, what would happen generally, like most things that aren't publicized is it's arbitrary who gets to reap the benefit of it, right? So part of what I wanted to do, Patrick, and this is the beauty of being old, right? So I ran for office at the ripe age of 47 years old. I just turned 50 on March 3rd. And so when I ran, I didn't want to trick anyone into voting for me. There were five Democrats in my race. And about six weeks before the primary, the Democratic primary, I put up on my website in writing, the 15 categories of crimes that in the first instance, I was going to decline, dismiss, or divert. And I wanted people to be able to look at that in writing and know that this is who I was going to be when I won, not if I won, but when. And so when